All of these symptoms, the amotivation, anhedonia, expressive deficit, we see that they tend to travel together. Um, that is to say, their severity it seems to increase together in individuals with schizophrenia. And the severity of those negative symptoms are one of the best predictors of someone's basically functional status. So as Roscoe alluded to, these are sort of the most debilitating symptoms of the disease itself. And so targeting these symptoms could potentially have the biggest impact in the quality of life of these patients. That's Dr. Roscoe Brady and Dr. Mark Halko from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. They'll be joining us to talk about their research on treating negative symptoms in schizophrenia. Their work appears in the July 2019 issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry. I'm Michael Roy, Executive Editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry, and this is AJP Audio. Dr. Roscoe Brady and Dr. Mark Halko are co-authors of an article in our July issue. Their article is titled, Cerebellar Prefrontal Network Connectivity and Negative Symptoms in Schizophrenia. Dr. Brady is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School in Boston. His research has focused on understanding the neural circuit foundations of symptoms in psychotic disorders. His work uses functional MRI to study how neural circuits affect different kinds of symptoms in mental illness. Dr. Halko is an assistant professor of neurology at Beth Israel and Harvard, and his work has looked at how whole brain networks are connected and operate. Currently, he studies how non-invasive brain stimulation can be used to develop novel network-based treatments for mental illness. Together, they run the Laboratory of Applied Neuroscience at BIDMC and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Brady, Dr. Halko, hello and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. And this is Mark. Thank you for having me as well. You bet. Now, at the beginning of your article, you mentioned there's a robust literature on how positive symptoms of schizophrenia, such as having delusions or hallucinations, don't do a great job of predicting the functional status of people with psychosis. And you write that negative symptoms, like not being able to feel pleasure or not having any motivation, are the best predictive factors when it comes to functional outcomes, such as unemployment and homelessness. So first, could you explain the difference between positive and negative symptoms and why they're important? Yeah, I'm happy to start off with this. Um, so in, in sum, when we think about schizophrenia, we are talking about basically a diagnosis that's based on observation, you know, first and foremost, and interview, and basically the, um, the long-standing observation that in schizophrenia, we see constellations of symptoms occur, like in the same patient, and at some point, basically, these, uh, these symptom clusters began being described in terms of, let's say, a positive or negative symptoms. Or another way to conceptualize this is basically, you know, the positive symptoms being symptoms that represent, like, uh, observable things that don't occur in populations that don't have a psychotic disorder. And negative symptoms somewhat broadly being thought of as deficits, that is to say, you know, a loss of normal functioning or a loss of normal behavior or cognition that you see in a population, a healthy comparison population. You know, it's the positive symptoms, things like uh, delusional beliefs, auditory hallucinations, thought disorganization that are the most, I would say, visible, you know, or readily observable symptoms of psychosis that basically we, when we see these occurring in a person, you know, chronically, we start to think about psychotic disorders like schizophrenia. But it is actually the negative symptoms that basically are the, some of the best predictors of functional status. So to define those terms, when we say negative symptoms, we're talking about a number of things like anhedonia, an inability to experience pleasure from things that should normally be pleasurable, and maybe a very specific deficit in anticipatory anhedonia. So if you ask someone, are you looking forward to doing something this weekend, and they'll say, no, actually, I, you know, I don't have any anticipation of enjoying that. So that would be an example of anhedonia. And other negative symptoms basically be amotivation, inability to kind of act on plans or ideas that you have some desire to. And finally, expressive deficit, by which I mean nonverbal communication deficits like decreased facial expression, 
all of these symptoms, the amotivation, anhedonia, expressive deficit, we see that they tend to travel together. Um, that is to say, their severity it seems to increase together in individuals with schizophrenia. And the severity of those negative symptoms are one of the best predictors of someone's basically functional status. Functional status here, I mean, what is the likelihood that this person has, uh, are these employed? What's the likelihood that this person basically has control of their own finances? The likelihood that they live independently? And somewhat broadly, their overall rating of their own quality of life. So interestingly enough, it's symptoms that are so visible to the rest of us, like hallucinations and delusional beliefs, those are actually not as uh, strong predictors of functional status as the negative symptoms. If you're concerned with uh, functional outcomes, right, then that really kind of draws your attention to negative symptoms and their severity. Maybe if, to, for reference for like the listeners, you know, I'd say the Katie trial, there is a pretty good paper from that trial, and, then, and actually a somewhat large body of literature really pointing out how the negative symptoms seem to be one of the best predictors of functional status. Okay, well now looking at negative symptoms more deeply, your study aimed to identify the root of negative symptoms in the brain and then to provide treatment in the form of non-invasive brain stimulation. So could you talk about why you and your co-authors first wanted to find the circuitry and then to target those regions that were connected to symptoms? Yeah, so as Roscoe alluded to, these are sort of the most debilitating symptoms of the disease itself. And so targeting these symptoms could potentially have the biggest impact in the quality of life of these patients. But also on a sort of secondary note, there isn't a whole lot of available accepted treatments to specifically target negative symptoms. Um, typical antipsychotics are not specifically targeting negative symptoms. And so the excitement for us is to sort of uh, tackle a problem that really has no current solution that's available to a, a clinician. And the way we're thinking about this is that we can, we can look at this, uh, as, as you alluded to, we can look at the brain networks, right? So the hope here is that we can understand um, the pathology of this particular symptom cluster in a way that could help uh, us in the future understand how, how to treat this disease. And this is a relatively important thing to think about. Uh, the way we think about antipsychotic treatments is not, was not really found uh, foundationally sort of based in network understanding or even um, brain circuitry. And so our hope is that if we could understand a little bit about the brain circuitry, that we would be able to sort of uh, be a little bit further along the path. And I think Roscoe can help explain a little bit of that too. Yeah, just to, just to dovetail on Mark's remarks here, you know, I, I am a practicing psychiatrist. I actually teach psychopharmacology to our residency training program. And, and just to state something that I think many, or many of your listeners already know, you know, the treatments that we use in clinic are not actually, no one conceptualized them as basically correcting an underlying problem, right? So basically the idea that like we use, uh, you know, serotonin reuptake inhibitors to treat depression. We don't actually think that like, you know, the heart of depression is basically serotonin deficiency. We use dopamine blocking, you know, dopamine receptor blocking agents basically to treat symptoms of psychosis. But again, like there is not, uh, there's not kind of a clear like signature that like what we're doing with these medications is correcting underlying pathophysiology. Really, the origin of these treatments is that at some point, you know, careful observation of animals, right, laboratory animals, other animals, it basically noticed that these medications had certain behavioral effects on them. And then once these were translated to humans, fortuitously, they actually proved beneficial, they proved helpful, you know, to these diseases. But again, the development of all of those treatments, like essentially everything that we do in clinic, it's not based on an understanding of the underlying pathophysiology, right? It's based on like, you know, I would say fortuitous observation. So our hope with this project was let's see if we can actually identify the pathophysiology, see if we can identify the problem, 
and then instead of looking for something that can help, let's see if we can actually correct the underlying problem. Indeed, and I think to your point, I think it was the previous lack of good information about the treatment of negative symptoms that led to such interest online when we published this article. And so, without further ado, let's get to the results of your study. What did you and your co-authors find? Yeah, so basically this, you know, the, the structure of the paper basically is, uh, I to call it a two-step process or two distinct experiments. I'm going to talk about the first part, which I'll, we in the paper refer to as network identification. Um, in brief, what we did was basically we looked in actual you know, participants with a schizophrenia diagnosis using non-invasive techniques, so using functional magnetic resonance imaging, and basically asked, is there something that we can derive from MRI signals you know, in the scanner that basically seems to correlate with the severity of negative symptoms, right? Can we find like a brain basis, either an anatomical location or a circuit? It's something that basically seems to travel with the symptom severity. And then basically the follow-up question is, can that actually lead us to something in terms of correcting this deficit, or can that give us a way of understanding how existing treatments can correct this deficit? Maybe the one thing I would highlight here, right, so there, there have been many, many studies out there using kind of similar techniques, using MRI to try to understand the brain basis of different symptoms in psychotic disorders and other psychiatric diseases. You know, maybe the one kind of flourish or maybe the one thing I would say that maybe distinguishes something that we did that isn't always done is we really tried to use like a, a truly data-driven approach, right? So I would say once you basically accept, you know, that, okay, we're going to study people with schizophrenia, we're going to use non-invasive imaging, the next step in that basically is to be really agnostic about the data and ask where does symptom severity really, really seem to correlate with a brain circuit, with a brain location, as opposed to walking into this with a preconceived hypothesis about what we should be looking for. Getting into specifics, you observed that more severe negative symptoms were linked to a breakdown in how the prefrontal cortex is connected with the cerebellum. Did this surprise you? And also, what's important to know about these parts of the brain in patients with this serious mental illness? So to that end, we basically we used like a multivariate pattern analysis, which um, really, when we looked at the data, kind of highlighted, you know, a particular brain circuit that really seemed to be I would say the best predictor in the entire brain of uh, negative symptom severity. What we found doing that was basically that uh, I would say maybe a familiar structure, so the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so basically a prefrontal region that has been long implicated in numerous cognitive processes, that was one end of the circuit. But maybe the more surprising thing was basically that it, the other end of the circuit was the cerebellum. So a brain region that historically, you know, many people, including myself previously, you know, have associated the cerebellum with uh, fine control of motor movements. Basically, the cerebellum, when I was in medical school, I was taught the cerebellum is important to, you know, letting you pick up a coffee cup without spilling. It's important to you being able to write your name legibly. But really, the cerebellum's role is for motor control. And so it was a surprise, right, to actually see that communication between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the cerebellum was the best brain predictor of negative symptom severity. Maybe I'll, I'll pause there and let Mark pick up with uh, the second part of this experiment, the second part of the paper. And so I think one of the unique components of this identification, uh, the network that uh, we identified is that this network, uh, prefrontal cortex to cerebellum, the strength of this connectivity varied with the strength of the negative symptoms such that as negative symptoms got worse, this connectivity was breaking down. And so what the next step that we sort of chose to do in a separate experiment with a separate patient cohort was to stimulate the cerebellum using uh, neuronavigated transcranial magnetic stimulation and measure the functional connectivity before and one week following the TMS. 
And so in this case, what we were doing is a sort of really rapid protocol for TMS such that patients would come in and for Monday through Friday, they would receive brief uh, intermittent theta burst stimulation that takes about three or four minutes to deliver, um, and they would receive it twice in the day. So they would receive it once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And then following, following that five-day course, we would follow up with them on the sub, uh, on a subsequent week and assess their symptom scales and assess their functional connectivity in the scanner so that we can ask the question, uh, this network that we identified in a larger cohort of patients, does this network um, that seems to be breaking down as symptoms get worse, does this network actually change as a result of the stimulation that we're doing? I don't really come from a, I come from a neuroimaging background. I don't come from an animal, I don't come from an animal background. And one of the things that our animal colleagues called this was a rescue of the network in, in such that the question really isn't, um, the question in our mind isn't really, uh, does this novel data set provide new network analysis, but rather does this, uh, does this brain stimulation experiment provide information as to whether or not this is a malleable circuit and whether or not this, this, the ability of the circuit to change corresponds to negative symptoms. So I'll let sort of Rothko tell you the final piece of this story because it was pretty exciting when he told me. Yeah, yeah. So, so and, and maybe, yes, and maybe even to put a little bit more, you know, uh, what suspense in the narrative here. One thing I do want to highlight, right, as someone who's, you know, I have published a number of imaging papers in the past that were similar to the first part of this kind of paper in the sense that, you know, we took a number of, you know, of uh, participants basically asked them questions about symptom severity and did a scan and basically and got a result that describes like as many that types of papers that I've written that describes you know a large amount of the psychiatric literature it was really teaming up with mark that basically let us do something I would say that to my mind is pretty special or I'd say I feel pretty fortunate we're able to do this which is really test that finding. And so to kind of highlight this, there are lots and lots and lots of papers out there that basically correlate some brain-based signal with um, observable clinical reality, right? Like how symptomatic someone is. But one thing that, you know, kind of always has to be in the back of your head is, you know, I'm seeing a correlation between two things. I'm seeing a correlation between what I, you know, what I observe on an interview and what we see in the scanner but what's the nature of that relationship? Like, did you know, did, did the scanner finding, did the circuit break down, did that cause the symptoms? Or is that circuit, the change we're seeing, is that the brain responding to an underlying disease? Or is it some, you know, completely unrelated phenomena? All right, that really, as a, someone who does imaging, it's always in the back of your mind. And so the great thing, right, about working with Mark is, Basically, we actually could try to address that. We could try to, we really could ask the question, if these things, so this circuit that we observe in the MRI and the symptoms that we observe on interview, if these things are causally related, right, then if you change the circuit, then the symptoms should change as well. And so that was it. Like basically that, and then like I said, this is the kind of the magical moment. Is that is exactly what we see. That is this circuit that we observed in part one between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the cerebellum. If you take a separate cohort of participants and you basically measure the circuit at two different time points, you know, a baseline and then after, you know, a week of TMS, the change in that circuit predicts basically almost entirely how different people are pre versus post TMS as far as symptom severity. Really, like I would say, kind of being, being consistent with an idea that these things really are causally related. You are looking at a circuit in which the breakdown of the circuit actually gives rise to these symptoms. And in a really exciting way, if you reverse that, symptom, that circuit breakdown, if you rescue it, as Mark says, then symptoms get better. The observable clinical reality actually is better off for it in a way that can be explained essentially entirely by circuit change. Um, it was, um, you know, a remarkable thing to see. 
And I think just to highlight one of the most remarkable parts of this finding is that even though we found a circuit that's distributed throughout the brain, it wasn't changed in, within the whole circuit that we saw this change after doing the stimulation, but it was just in the cerebellar component of this circuit, such that we believed that the targeted neuromodulation we were doing was affecting a specific part of this circuit rather than um, observing just patients change from day to day, from week to week. Um, and it was a targeted to this particular network rather than across the whole brain. Okay, so clearly some very exciting and encouraging stuff. So what other aspects of your study do you feel might be relevant for researchers, clinicians, and other mental health professionals? We think that these tools are available today for clinicians and researchers today. And I think that's the most exciting thing to tell everyone is that you know, we're working with tools that are widely available. You know, functional imaging is, is available to a number of uh, institutions, and transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, is become, has become a mature technology that's available um, to people. So what's exciting for us is that we can use these tools that are available today to ask questions that patients want, want solutions for and families want solutions for today. And so what we're hoping to be able to sort of do is sort of push the boundaries of what's, uh, what's available with what we can do. Maybe to highlight that point, Mark is stating, you know, one of, one of, the, one of the really nice things, right, about using, I think what I, you know, what we may have termed in the paper is a pair of mature technologies, you know, so resting state functional connectivity, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Just as Mark says, like basically these tools are not, how to put this, some, uh, you know, bespoke uh, thing that's only available at one institution. Like these are things that are, you know, they've widely been embraced. They are somewhat well understood and basically they're accessible so that if you, if people were encouraged by these results, right, and basically wanted to think about them in a really translational way, you know, this, I would say, we are in a space already where that we can start thinking about what do we need to do to translate this into clinical care? Like, what are the questions we need to address, right? So, and, and you can think of a lot of things that we need to pin down before this moves into, like, you know, clinical treatment we need to figure out like what's the right amount, you know, what is the right duration of treatment, trying to figure out who can respond to this and who will not respond, thinking about questions of how long will this last for an individual. So, you know, we don't know how long this kind of, uh, you know, symptom uh, amelioration lasts. But all of those questions, they can be addressed using kind of the skills and technologies that we, that are widespread today. None of those questions, rely, say, another leap in our understanding. None of those questions need, you know, some other kind of barrier to be broken. We can really start addressing those in a translational research way sooner rather than later. And I, I find that actually pretty exciting and compelling. I think for, just to sort of complete the circuit here, I think we think that not just these tools are necessary, right? That, you know, in finding a circuit that might be related to negative symptoms, we think uh, this could be valuable to other, other investigators looking at certain negative symptom change across a wide a, a number of other modalities, right? So it's not necessarily uh, dependent on using non-invasive brain stimulation as we're doing here, but rather on changing a circuit that we think is associated with negative symptoms. If I would love to find out if other investigators are able to change a circuit, this circuit in, an, in, an, in a different way, it would be exciting for us uh, to, see, to see happen. Yeah, yeah, and just just to highlight that last point, I mean, it's you know we we've, we've chosen to use a couple of approaches here because they've matured to the point where we have I'd say we have an understanding of like what we're measuring, some understanding of what we're measuring. We have an understanding of how to manipulate the circuit, you know, with uh, so non-invasive techniques. But you know, there are all sorts of technologies that are really that are on the not-so-distant horizon, 
you know, initiatives like, like the Brain Initiative and so on that are, you know, explicitly uh, funding a lot of different approaches to look at how can we, you know, how can we manipulate, you know, the brain? How can we manipulate brain circuits? How can we find malleable circuits for the purposes of therapeutic change? It really, um, you know, the mind boggles at thinking about some of the things we'll be able to do in the future. And it, you can conceptualize a future where, you know, where we have had to put this, identified a circuit for change by TMS, as we've done in the paper, or identified a circuit for change via any number of other techniques, just as Mark said. Now, I'm going to ask you both to go beyond your study and tell us what you think is on the horizon for your line of research and in clinical care. I think the, what we're hoping is that this, this type of study uh, brings up a novel approach to, to understanding psychotic disorder, psychiatric disorders where we're identifying these circuits and watching them change rather than making uh, treatment attempts and then looking at symptom outcomes. And the hope is is that uh, these networks can sort of serve as intermediary steps to sort of tracking uh, along along with patients. And also, uh, we, we're hoping that this could be potentially a target that will track along with other symptoms. So not necessarily this particular circuit, but maybe other circuits where perhaps patient response can be sort of viewed along the way, um, but not necessarily mandatory. And so that will sort of help us understand um, how we could potentially treat patients, how we can change brain circuits, and how those changes in brain circuits could lead to potential improvement in, in therapeutic outcomes. I think one important thing to sort of say, state about this is that this, the future is really bright right now for neuroscience research as a whole. The advent of the Brain Initiative sort of pushing, pushing us to sort of develop new tools and new technologies sort of means that uh, clinicians are going to have access, access to new ways to think about the brain. And, and one would hope that in the future we'll be able to identify these tools and, and, and really translate them into practice or even translate or, or maybe even just short term translate them into trial opportunities. So I think it's particularly exciting. It's a particularly exciting time to be thinking about mental illness because we might actually have um, some tractable approaches available that can change how we think about um, treatment as a whole. You know, I, I would just like to express, you know, our appreciation for the people who participated in these studies. So this is all, you know, human participant research that, you know, required a lot of people to volunteer, you know, their time and uh, work with us to kind of accomplish these trials. Um, and, and we're just very grateful for that because this is, um, you know, we, we could not have, it may be an obvious thing to say, but we could not have done this without a lot of people uh, volunteering, right, to come participate in this research. And we're very grateful for that because this endeavor, really, you know, everything that we're doing going forward, it, it similarly, you know, relies on people, you know, seeing a poster, seeing a flyer, seeing an ad, and putting their faith in us that basically that if we work together, we can do so in a safe way and actually might help someone else out down the road. Dr. Roscoe Brady and Dr. Mark Halko, co-authors of an article in our July issue on treating negative symptoms in schizophrenia. Thank you both for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share our work. This concludes this episode of AJP Audio. You can rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to it. Please also visit our website, ajp.psychiatryonline.com org to check out trending articles, find CME courses, and watch videos highlighting some of our other articles. Be sure to check out two other podcasts from APA Publishing. Psychiatry Unbound, our newest podcast, is APA Publishing's Books Podcast. It's hosted by Dr. Laura Roberts, Editor-in-Chief of APA Books. You can hear the voices behind the most prominent scholarship in the field of psychiatry today. Also check out From Pages to Practice, which reviews the latest research published in the journal Psychiatric Services. 
It's hosted by Dr. Lisa Dixon, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal, along with Dr. Josh Barrison. You can find these podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or on the podcast page of the American Psychiatric Association's website. Next month in the podcast, we'll talk with Elizabeth Binder from the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Munich and Emory University in Atlanta about her research on mental health development in children and adolescents. We hope you'll join us too. Thank you for listening.